Welcome to this first class on the Canons of Dort. As we begin this class, I want to remind you that the purpose in studying church history for us as Christians is not merely academic. And so while we will look at history and documents and theology from those documents, and we'll look at this from an academic perspective, I want to encourage you to think of this as also a means by which you may grow in your Christian faith. And because of that, let me open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing of church history. We thank you for the blessing of being able to come together as a class and to look at this topic. We would ask that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct us as we look at this topic, that what we study would not merely be academic, academic, but it would also be edifying to us in our walk with Christ, and that it would bring glory to you. And we will pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to understand the canons of Dort, uh, we need to understand the Synod of Dort. And to understand the Synod of Dort, we need to have a brief history. Uh, the Protestant Reformation, as you may know, uh, beginning prior to Martin Luther's nailing of his 95 Thesis upon the Wittenberg Castle door, uh, which was October 31st, 1517, uh, began prior to that, but then moved through Europe and made its way into the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, the church in Netherlands was highly affected by the Protestant movement really coming out of Geneva, Switzerland, highly influenced by John Calvin uh, as really that whole expansion of Western Europe was. And we find the topic for our study today uh, in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, as the Reformation had moved there, the local churches uh, began to be established with ministers and elders and deacons, uh, very similar to what we would know uh, in our Presbyterian form of government today. They would meet in regional assemblies that were called classes, and from those classes they would send delegates to synods. Uh, that is spelled S-Y-N-O-D-S, to a synod. And again, that is very similar, although different terminology, it's very similar to our Presbyterian form of government where we have a local church where there is a, a minister and there are elders which forms a session and then there is presbytery and then in, in our, in the PCA we don't have a synod although the old Presbyterian U.S. Uh, church did have uh, synods and then we have a general assembly. And it, again, it's not an identical match but again so that you can understand that their structure of government government, uh, church, the Reformed Church within the Netherlands was somewhat similar to what we understand here. And so there would be both uh, regional synods and then also there would be a national synod or a national assembly. In the Netherlands, the Reformed Church uh, adopted a standard of confession as well as a catechism. Now, Again, because of the timing that we're talking about here, uh, late 1500s, early 1600s, uh, of course the Westminster uh, Confession uh, had not been produced from the Westminster Assembly, which is in the 1640s, uh, but the church in the Netherlands adopted the Belgic Confession, which was drafted in, the, in 1561. And then they adopted as their catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, which was drafted in 1563. All the ministers and elders and deacons were required to subscribe to the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism as their standard of doctrine. Of course, Beneath the Word of God. And again, that's very similar to us, 
uh, as a minister within uh, our denomination, as well as the uh, elders of this church and the deacons of this church, uh, we're all required to subscribe to the Westminster Standards, the Confession, the Larger and Shorter Catechism. So again, a, a similar structure, a similar church in the Netherlands. Growing up in this environment, the top, the, the, the personality of our study rests on a young man named Jacob Arminius, or Jacobus Arminius. And what we know, though very little, what we know of Arminius is, is he was a very bright young man. Uh, he was a gifted student. He excelled in his studies, and he eventually completed what we would call his graduate work or his undergraduate work in the Netherlands. He then went to Switzerland and did his graduate work. Uh, in Switzerland, he studied both in uh, Basel, Switzerland, as well as Geneva, Switzerland. And in Geneva at that time, John Calvin had already died, uh, but John Calvin's understudy, uh, the brilliant Theodore Beza, was the one who was uh, sort of running the reformed establishment there, and uh, Arminius had the opportunity to study underneath Theodore Beza, which in, was in truly uh, a highlight, I'm sure, of his education. Uh, after completing his graduate studies, then Jacob Arminius moved back to the Netherlands, and then he served as a minister in a local church there. And he, stu he served as a minister uh, between 1588 and 1603, so well over a decade he actually served in the pastorate, uh, applying in a very practical sense what he had studied in Geneva. And then he eventually became a professor, moving from uh, the pastorate in 1603. He became a professor at the University of Leiden, and he stayed in that role until he died in 1609. So he really wasn't a university professor for very long, the latter part of his life, uh, but it was in that period of time uh, that he had his most profound effect that we are looking at today. Now, Jacob Arminius did not produce any uh, printed, published works within his lifetime. Um, he ha did, however, uh, produce a work called The Declaration of Sentiments, and uh, that was a controversial document within his lifetime, the latter part of his life, as it subscribed to doctrines that were contrary to the Calvinistic doctrines of the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. But really, about the time that uh, his controversy be began to, to move outside of the university setting into a national setting, Arminius died. But that document had an impact on others who had studied the document and others who had studied underneath Arminius. And in 1610, so a, a year after Arminius died, uh, a document was formulated called the Remonstrance. Or Remonstrance. And in essence, what it was, it, it was more like a signed petition. Uh, there were those who were in the church of the Netherlands that uh, were not subscribing to the standard document, the doctrines of the church, and uh, they knew that they were due church discipline. And so to avoid church discipline and to push back uh, on the church's doctrines, uh, they signed a petition with five articles or five points of this remonstrance. There were 46 ministers who signed this petition. And to be clear, uh, these weren't rebels. Uh, these weren't uh, deviants. Uh, as what little we know, they were godly men uh, serving the church, uh, but they did not agree with the church's doctrine on at least these five points. 
points. Now, to be clear, and this is sometimes confusing as this topic is studied, um, they, in articulating their position in this remonstrance, uh, they used language that would be very familiar in that day and that would be language very familiar in the Reformation. And as students of God's Word, uh, they were searching the Scripture, so they argued to uh, argue these points of doctrine. And they believed that they had very compelling arguments. So, let's look at their arguments. Uh, We're going to look at uh, the remonstrance of 1610. However, you need to know a little bit more history before we look at that. In 1611, uh, the, the church responded, or those held to the orthodox doctrines of the church, responded to the remonstrance with what is called the counter-remonstrance. Uh, five articles, or five points of the remonstrance, and the church responded in 1611 with a counter-remonstrance, not of five arguments, but of seven arguments. And so, I want us to look at the remonstrance, but I'm also going to read to you the counter-remonstrance so we can get an idea of the difference between these two doctrines. So let's look at this. Um, I'm, uh, so the, the remonstrance was uh, written in Latin. I am reading from the translation uh, by James T. Dennison, Jr. Uh, in uh, a May, a book called The Reformed Confessions of the 16th and 17th Centuries in English Translation. This is volume four of a four-volume set, uh, and it is worth purchasing if you enjoy church history. Uh, I have all four volumes, and I, I look to them regularly. This is actually the remonstrance uh, that I'm going to be reading from is the English translation from the Latin by Denison. All right. First argument, quote, God, by an eternal and unchangeable decree in His Son, Christ Jesus, before laying the foundation of the world, determined out of the human race fallen in sin to save those in Christ, on account of Christ, and through Christ, who through the grace of the Holy Spirit, would believe on His same Son, and who would persevere in that very faith and obedience of faith, through the same grace without ceasing to the end. But on the other hand, to leave the obstinate and unbelieving under sin and wrath, and condemn them as alienated from Christ, according to the word of the gospel, He that believes in the Son has eternal life, but he that does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John 3.36 To which other expressions of Scripture correspond. Now, I realize I'm just reading to you. I hope you know by now uh, that we're always more discerning when we read something as opposed to watch or listen to something. So uh, you bear with me here. But again, if if you're interested in this study, I encourage you, you can find it free online, to to read the remonstrance. Uh, I'm reading to you. Uh, You can hear that that is a doctrine that is subscribed uh, in, by many modern Christian churches today. In fact, by virtue of the language that they use, you may have heard in that, well, maybe not anything different than what you believe we subscribe to. However, as you dig into it a little bit more, what you find is that what the remonstrance uh, and spelling, uh, remonstrance, R-E-M-O-N-S-T-R-A-N-C-E is the document. Uh, those who made the argument are the remonstrance, ending in T-S. Uh, or maybe if it's just helpful, we could refer to them as the Arminians, uh, as they're referred to in modern context. Uh, those disciples of Jar- Jacob Arminius, the Arminian argument, Article 1.1, what they're doing is... Uh, 
instead of pushing back against a particular document, for, for, do, doctrine. For example, in this first article, we see that they cannot deny the doctrine of predestination. So what they have to do is they have to redefine it. And if they can redefine predestination, then they can continue with their argument. Uh, it is a progressive argument. Argument one leads to two, leads to three, leads to four, leads to five. They don't really stand alone, but build upon them. And right now, what they're doing is, is they're building their argument by redefining what predestination is. Instead of believing that God elects individuals, what they're arguing in this first article is that God chooses the criteria for salvation that an individual must meet to be saved. Well, how did the church, how did the Orthodox Calvinists respond to this first point? Well, they chose to respond with three points. Uh, in their seven response, the first three points are response. And I want to, to read to you. I'm going to read all three of them to you, so you hang in there. Stay strong. Point one. And again, listen carefully to how they're arguing against that first point of the remonstrance. As in Adam, the whole human race created in the image of God, has with Adam fallen into sin and thus become so corrupt that all men are conceived and born in sin and thus are by nature children of wrath, lying dead in their trespasses so that there is within them no more power to convert, to convert themselves truly unto God and to believe in Christ than a corpse has power to raise itself from the dead. So God draws out of His condemnation and delivers a certain number of men who in His eternal and immutable counsel He has chosen out of mere grace, according to the good pleasure of His will, unto salvation in Christ, passing by others in His just judgment and leaving them in their sins. So the pushback of the Calvinist is, is that you cannot seek to, to follow some sort of plan of salvation on your own. God must act because you are dead in your sin. Point two, that not only adults who believe in Christ and accordingly walk worthy of the gospel are to be reckoned as God's elect children, but also the children of the covenant so long as they do not in their conduct manifest the contrary. And, there, and that therefore believing parents, when their children die in infancy, have no reason to doubt the salvation of their children. And again, this would be pertinent within the era, of course, uh, that they were living, that... Uh, there would be many deaths, deaths of children, and so forth and so on. Uh, what they're doing there is they're uh, addressing something that the remonstrants didn't point out in their first point, uh, but they're sort of showing, well, your argument is, is, uh, uh, is not strong enough because uh, you devise this sort of plan of, of salvation that someone must believe in, but what about children? Uh, what about the ch a child of believing parents? A child. And then in the third point, again responding to Remonstrance point one, they say, quote, that God in His election has not looked to the faith or conversion of His elect, nor to the right use of His gifts as the grounds of election, but that on the contrary, he, in His eternal and immutable counsel, has purposed and decreed to bestow faith and perseverance in godliness, and thus to save those whom He, according to His good pleasure, has chosen to salvation. So, again, you hear very clearly there, the Orthodox Calvinists are, are push, pushing back against that first point in saying, no, it's not that God devises a system so that someone may believe, but rather God chooses before the foundation of the world His children, the elect. All right, so let's go back to the remonstrance and let's look at their second argument. Argument number 
2, or Article 2, or Point 2. Quote, Accordingly, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, has died for each and every man, and through His death on the cross has merited reconciliation and forgiveness of sins for all. Nevertheless, so that no one in fact becomes a partaker of His forgiveness except believers, and that also according to the words of the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And in the first epistle of John, He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Chapter 2, verse 2. Again, when you hear that at first reading, uh, you think, wow, well that, that sounds like the gospel. Uh, that sounds biblically accurate. They're even quoting verses uh, in there to make their argument. And of course, uh, John 3.16 and 1 John 2.2, 2, uh, they believe to be their trump card, so to speak. However, dig into it a little bit more deeply, what we find is that what they're arguing, whether they understand it or not, is that they're arguing that Christ died for every single person. And let me retract what I just said just a second ago. I wasn't careful enough. They did understand that. Uh, that's part of their argument. But uh, they're arguing that Christ died for every single person. And again, to make this argument compelling, uh, in light of John 3.16, uh, they're saying Christ died for the world. What's the problem with that? Well, the first part of the problem is, is if that is the case, then why isn't everyone saved? If He died for every single person, then every single person should be saved. We know that not all are saved. In fact, the matter of the effect of Christ's atoning work, even though they use language to address that, they skip over it undefined. What is the effect of Christ's atoning work on the cross? If Christ's atoning work is truly efficacious, then everyone should be saved. But the extent of the atonement is completely unaddressed in this second point. Well, how did the Calvinists respond to the Arminians? Well, in their fourth point, they respond this way. And again, listen for the counter-argument. Quote, that to this end, He has first of all presented and given to them His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, whom He delivered up to the cross, uh, rather up to the death of the cross, in order to save His elect. So that, although the suffering in Christ, as that of the only begotten and unique Son of God, is sufficient unto the atonement of the sins, all men, nevertheless, the same, according to the counsel and decree of God, has its efficacy unto reconciliation and forgiveness of sins only in the elect and true believer. I tried to change the intonation of my voice there to get you to pick up on some key words uh, in their response, but what, what you hear is they're responding and saying, uh, your argument has a key problem the extent or efficaciousness of the atoning work of Christ on the cross. And they argue that while we concede that Christ's death was sufficient for all, it was not efficacious for all. It was efficacious only for the elect of God. All right, moving on to point of the remonstrance. Point three, quote, Man has no saving faith of himself, nor from the strength of his own free will. Since in the state of apostasy and sin, he is not able to think, will, or do anything good. What indeed is truly good, such as saving faith is in the first place. 
But it is necessary that he be regenerated and also renewed by God in Christ through his Holy Spirit in his intellect, affections, or will in all his powers that he may rightly understand, ponder, will, and also accomplish the true good as it is written, without me you are able to do nothing. Now in this third article, Uh, What they're arguing is the necessity of God's grace. That we are saved only by God's grace. Yep. That's right. That's it. And we would agree with that article. But for its preparation for the next paragraph. Now, before I go to uh, the counter-remonstrance, before I go to the Calvinist response to the Arminian argument, um, I want us to go ahead and read the next point, because we need to see how these two tie together. We may agree with the third point of the remonstrance, but it's Article 4 that builds on it. So let's go ahead and read this fourth point in the remonstrance. Quote, This grace, the grace that the previous paragraph has just described, this grace is the beginning, the increase, and completion of every good thing. To be sure, even that the regenerate person himself is not able to think, will, or accomplish good, nor resist any temptation to evil apart from or preceding that prevenient, moving, accompanying and cooperating grace, so that all good works and actions which are able to be conceived must be ascribed to the grace of God in Christ. As for the rest, what pertains to the manner of operation of this grace, that is, it is not irresistible, since indeed it is written about many that they resisted the Holy Spirit, Acts 7 uh, verse 51, and several other places. And again, they're, they're coming back, they're, they're quoting from Scripture, seeking to make their argument. They've built upon the necessity of grace. And in this fourth point, they're elaborating, arguing that grace can be rejected. We, we heard it there uh, in the very word of it's not irresistible. Uh, God's grace, uh, although it may be powerful, it may be rejected uh, by someone, whoever, that wants to reject it. The determining factor in salvation, as they argued here, is that it is human choice, not God's sovereign choice. Uh, Again, this should sound very familiar. Uh, This is what the vast... A number of American Christians believe uh, is that it's up to me. I get a vote. It's a democracy. And uh, I get to choose God. God doesn't choose me. And and that's that's an argument that goes well uh, well before uh, the remonstrance. But we're hearing it articulated here in this point in time. Well, how do the Calvinists... How do they argue back in this counter-remonstrance? Let me read to you point 5 and 6. Listen to them coupled together. Point 5. Quote, That furthermore, to the same end, God the Lord has His holy gospel preached, and that the Holy Spirit externally, through the preaching of that same gospel, and internally through a special grace works so powerfully in the hearts of God's elect that He illumines their minds, transforms and renews their wills, removing the heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh in such a manner that by these means they not only receive power to convert themselves and believe, but also actually and willingly do repent and believe." The language is nuanced in pushing back to the remonstrance argument of the necessity of grace. But what you hear here is they're emphasizing uh, 
God's sovereign work. And then building upon that, in point six of the counter-remonstrance, they say, quote, that those whom God has decreed to save are not only once so enlightened, regenerated, and renewed in order to believe in Christ and convert themselves to God, but they by the same power of the Holy Spirit by which they were converted to God without any contribution of themselves are in like manner continually supported and preserved. So that, although many weaknesses of the flesh cleave to them, as long as they are in this life and are engaged in a continual struggle between flesh and spirit, and also sometimes fall into grievous sins, nevertheless, this same spirit prevails in this struggle, not permitting that God's elect by the corruption of the flesh should so resist the spirit of sanctification that this would at any time be extinguished in them and that in consequence they could completely or finally lose the true faith which was only bestowed on them and the spirit of adoption as God's children which they had once received. Now, in this point six, they're, they're bridging this gap. They're moving from uh, the point uh, three and four of the remonstrance, and, and they're going to get into uh, where the remonstrance goes uh, in its last fifth point. Uh, so, uh, but I, I chose to go ahead and read to you all of that just to show you what they're arguing is, is the sovereign choice of God through the working of His Holy Spirit in the redemption of His elect of that argument. Now, they're going to go, they also go in here into what we would call the perseverance of the saints, uh, but let's go back now to the remonstrance, uh, because that's going to be their, their landing argument here. Point number five of the remonstrance. Quote, those who are grafted into Christ by true faith and as a consequence have been made participants of His life-giving Spirit have been abundantly equipped by this power by which they are able to fight against Satan, sin, the world, and their flesh, and therefore also obtain the victory over them. Nevertheless, always, because we wish to be careful, assisted in every temptation by the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ Himself, through His Spirit, holds out His hand and if only they are prepared to fight themselves and beseech His help, do not desert Him themselves, secures and confirms them, so that they are seduced by no deceit or power of Satan, nor are able to be ripped out of the hands of Christ according to the word of Christ. No one takes my sheep out of my hand. John 10, 28. As for the rest, whether they themselves are not able through carelessness and then they, they, they quote Greek here, tain, uh, arcane, tain, uh, prostosos, Christo, katalelamain. Uh, don't forward this video to my uh, seminary Greek professor, my poor pronunciation, but translated what that means is, is to abandon the beginning of their subjection to Christ. Now, the arguing there is, uh, or to, to go through that more fluidly, as for the rest, whether they themselves are not able through the carelessness to abandon the beginning of their subjection to Christ, and then they go on, and embracing again this present world to forsake the holy doctrine once delivered to them, to let a good conscience slip away and to despise grace, must be more accurately sought from the sacred scripture before we are able to teach others with, in another Greek word here, uh, play Rosophia, uh, so play Rosophia, which means uh, wisdom that comes or the philosophy that's gained uh, uh, in. To be clear, uh, what they're doing there in compliment to them, they're they're ending that fifth point in humility. Um, they're they're submitting themselves and saying, "This is our." our uh, but we, we understand in this pushback, this signed petition, this remonstrance, uh, that we're, we're ending this in, in humility, uh, saying uh, that this is not fully described as we understand it uh, in, in Scripture. 
Well, what we hear in this last uh, point, and I, I know that was a lot to read, but what we hear in this last point uh, is uh, that they're arguing for the sanctifying power of God's grace in the life of every believer, but, and I hope that you heard it there, but what they're also saying is, but there's also the potential that someone could fall from salvation. and Someone could fall from grace. And you hear that in the, the idea of, of, of Christ reaching out His hand and, and well, what happens if you don't take His hand and that imagery that they're, they're conveying there. Well, uh, the best response to this, actually not the, the best response, but I think that the powerful response to this is in the counter-remonstrance in their last and seventh point. And so uh, let's look at that. Point seven of the counter remonstrance, quote, that nevertheless, the true believers find no excuse in this teaching to pursue carelessly the lusts of the flesh, since it is impossible that those who by a true faith are engrafted into Christ should not produce the fruits of thankfulness. Uh, Let me pause right there. If you think of the pushback against easy believism in our age, of people referring to themselves as Christians, others referring to themselves as Christians, even though there's, there's nothing in their life that would show that they are true believers, that, that wasn't invented in the late 20th, 21st century. Uh, that's the argument they're making here uh, in this seventh point. But on the contrary... The more they assure themselves and feel that God works in them, both to will and to do, to his to do according to his good pleasure, the more they persist in working their own salvation. In other words, there's evidence within the Christian life. Since they know that this is the only means by which it pleases God to keep them standing and to bring them to salvation. For this reason, he also employs in his word all manner of warnings and threatenings, not in order to cause them to despair or doubt their salvation, but rather to awaken in them a childlike fear by observing the weakness of their flesh in which they would surely perish, unless the Lord keep them standing in His undeserved grace, which is the sole cause and ground of their perseverance." So that although he warns them in his word to watch and pray, they nevertheless do not have this of themselves that they desire and lack nothing, but only from the same Spirit who by a special grace prepares them for this and thus also powerfully keeps them standing. And the the argument that they're they're making, again pushing back uh, to that fifth argument in the remonstrance, uh, is that God's grace carries us forever. That we cannot, those who are as evidenced by the Holy Spirit's presence within our life, producing fruit in our life, that we will be sustained till the end. Well, what happened out of this? Uh, Remonstrance in 1610, the counter-remonstrance in 1611, uh, what happened uh, from that? Well, uh, back in the day uh, when the theology was uh, a national matter, a big deal, we would say, uh, it actually led to a conflict between uh, the Orthodox Calvinists and the Arminians, and that conflict went on for seven years. And it almost led to, within the Netherlands, a civil war. Thankfully, the Dutch government stepped in and they called for a national synod, national council, if you will, to be convened in Dordrecht or Dort. And I may have mispronounced uh, the way that first name, but that we often refer to it as Dort. Uh, they called for a synod. Synod in Dort to be convened, uh, which was convened on November 13th, which is also Brandon Boland's birthday, which gives him the theological trump card in our church office in all arguments. But November the 13th, 1618. So again, keep the date straight here. 
Remonstrance argued in 610, Counter Remonstrance 1611, almost a civil war in that seven year period, and then the Synod of Dort, November 13th, 1618, uh, was convened. Well, what happened at the Synod of Dort? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, and that is exactly what we're going to cover next study, our next class. Let me pray for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank You for those who have gone before us. We thank You for those who love Your Word so much to dive in, to dig in, to defend the doctrines of Your Holy Word. And we thank You that we are recipients of those We pray that you would help us to be careful students, that you would help us to be discerning, that what we hear, what we see, what we read, that we would be careful students. And we pray that you would continue to bless us in our study. May we be edified in our walk with Christ, and may you get all the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.